Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. As you can see in the picture of Inquisition Update, this one is another part of me working together with Brother Tom Fress from the Ministry Inquisition Update in the United States of America. And we are gathered here together via Skype to bring you the 23rd uh, broadcast, whatever you're going to call it, a study actually we are doing on showing and proving to you that Jesus Christ was the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel 70 week prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, 2000 years ago. And the New Testament is our um, foundation to prove it. It's our rock. It's like Jesus is the rock. The New Testament is the rock because those are the words of Jesus Christ. And that proves without any doubt that Jesus was the complete fulfillment of Daniel 70 years week. There is no future fulfillment of Daniel 70 years week. There is no future tribulation seven year, quote unquote. There is no future rapture. It is all part of a Jesuitical theater, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, and Satan himself with his um, representative on earth, the papacy, the popes in the past, the current pope, and the coming popes are playing this theater to you to take your focus away of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. If you don't know him, you are lost. That's what the Jesuits want. That's why they tell you there's a future fulfillment of something that has passed 2,000 years ago. And that's why Tom and I are so engaged to bring to you now for the 23rd and I hope for many, many more times broadcasts wherein we prove by the New Testament that Jesus Christ was the perfect and complete fulfillment of that prophecy. Enough said for me. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Yes, and um, and uh, nicely articulated, and also uh, that the the New Testament is the historical record of the fulfillment of the seventieth week of Daniel by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince. The New Testament is the historical record of it. Daniel prophesied; history recorded the fulfillment. We just are very fortunate 
to have that portion of history recorded for us in the Bible. Okay, so many of the, the other prophecies in the Bible are yet to be fulfilled in the future. We don't have a historical record of their fulfillment yet because they haven't been fulfilled. But we do have a perfect and complete record of every detail of Daniel's 70-week prophecy in the New Testament. So uh, it's, it's a divine writing, and it's infallible, and we can trust it implicitly. And uh, when someone chooses to argue with us about whether or not the, the, the 70th week of Daniel is future, we have a divine and infallible historical record of the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And, and I said kind of clumsily the other day, uh, it's almost as if, uh, if not the main purpose, uh, the New Testament was written for the very purpose of recording in every detail the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, because that's the way it's written. It's written with a purpose, and uh, and all the details of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Messiah the Prince is recorded in the New Testament. Maybe we can say it's it this just, way, uh, Tom. The New Testament is the New Covenant, and Jesus Christ came in the flesh to uh, confirm <laughs> that New Covenant with his blood right. for all of us. That's right. For a testament, it is necessary that the testator, I think is the name, uh, uh -huh. dies. Yep. And Jesus died. He died uh -huh. for us on the cross. He went to the grave three days and three nights. He rose again by the power of God, by the power of the Father in heaven, and was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was mm -hmm. seen by hundreds of people during weeks here on earth before he ascended into heaven and sent the Comforter mm -hmm. to lead us into all truth. The New Testament is the new covenant that was spoken of, the covenant or the, yeah, the covenant that was spoken of in Daniel chapter 9. He yeah. will confirm the covenant with many for one week. A new covenant, a new testament. Yep. And uh, what, what is striking is when, when, when people begin to comprehend uh, that the 70th week of Daniel is over. By 2,000 years, it's over. And we begin to wonder, what is the purpose of the future fulfillment that we are told by all of our pastors and all of our churches? What could the purpose of that be? What has Satan concocted uh, to make the whole world believe that Jesus was not the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. To make us believe that, a different Jesus. That's right. That it's what this is of, of all the things that we talk about, that's one of the most important. That you comprehend the diabolical purpose behind the futurist teaching. And uh, and 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 also the human effort, not divine effort. The human effort, the divine effort was 2,000 years ago. The fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel was divinely fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And I'm talking about the human effort to fulfill a future 70th week of Daniel. First of all, there's got to be a temple. There's got to be animal sacrifices. When we know the scripture plainly tells us that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands and animal sacrifices never could take away sin. So why is the whole Christian world looking for a rebuilt temple and animal sacrifice to be resumed on Temple Mount in Jerusalem? For that matter, why do we why are we so anxious about a modern nation state of Israel or Jerusalem uh, to be the capital? Why are we so interested in uh, helping the Jews make Aliyah to Israel when none of it's called for except to fulfill a future 70th week of Daniel because 
to fulfill it, you have to have a modern nation, the state of Israel, with Jews living in the land and a demand for a temple and animal sacrifices. And all they got to do is put up a phony antichrist to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. And that will convince the whole Christian world who's prepared to accept this seven-year tribulation, this seven-year covenant with the Jews by the so-called antichrist. And uh, this person could be Donald Trump. It could be Barack Obama. It could be Mickey Mouse, for all that matter. And the whole Christian world will be irretrievably convinced that that is the Antichrist. Whoever signs that seven-year peace treaty and then reneges after three and a half years or whatever. And then once Antichrists have been positively identified by signing that seven-year peace treaty and then after three and a half years breaking the treaty and causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease, then the world is just as prepared to receive the Christ, whoever that will be, will, who will come and kill the Antichrist or to somehow do away with this Antichrist. And whoever does it is going to be the world's hero to all the futurist Christians in the world, which is the lion's share of Christians, and I used to be one of them. And I predict what, what must be that it's going to be the papacy. The papacy has always claimed divine right to rule the world. The papacy has always claimed divine right to forgive sin and to, you know, uh, make absolution for sin. The papacy has always claimed the vicar of Christ status, that is, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. That's the very re that's the very foundation of the papacy, and uh, all all the ancient Roman uh, Catholic documents, Roman Catholic Catholic canon law establishes that the papacy is, as it were, God on earth, and he has so much power that the kings of the earth must obey him. That the papacy is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him that every man, woman, and child on the planet is consciously bound to obey the Pope as if he were God on earth. And uh, I believe he's nothing but the vicar of Satan in the world. And it's the fulfillment of a prophecy that Isaiah recorded in chapter 14 of Isaiah. And... Um, We've, we've quoted it so many times, I ought to know it by heart. I always have trouble quoting it uh, precisely. But it's the, the five I wills. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will you know, uh, exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. That prophecy is fulfilled in the papacy. Okay, this is how Satan fulfills it. He's got to do it in the flesh, and he does it through the flesh of the papacy. Okay, just like God had to accomplish our redemption, and he did it in the flesh of his own son, Jesus. And Satan, also a spirit, has to fulfill his prophecy, but he has to do it through flesh, and that flesh is the papacy. And I don't think this is rocket science. I don't think this is so difficult to understand. It's certainly far easier to understand than the futurist malarkey we've been taught from cradle to grave. And that's why I've dedicated so much time, effort over the last 20 years to wake people up to the, to the futurist lies. Lies that were never told in this world until about 1810 in England, in the, in the seminaries of, of Protestant England. The Jesuits, in their war against Protestantism, took this teaching into the Protestant seminaries, and the Protestants just gobbled it up like strychnine. And it's a lethal concoction. 
It has completely destroyed Protestantism. There's no protest against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist anymore because everybody's this futurist teaching has exonerated the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. Nobody blames the papacy of being Antichrist, the Antichrist anymore. And that's the head, that, that's what brings about this, this ecumenical movement to restore the Protestant churches back under papal authority. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's diabolical. It's absolutely diabolical that the churches are leading God's people away from Christ and to Antichrist. Now, I can't think of a more serious nor a more important discussion for God's people today. We're not talking about economics. We're not talking about health issues. We're not talking about uh, science or technology, things that don't matter. We're talking about everlasting life. We're talking about that which affects our eternal existence. There's no more important discussion that a man can engage in than this discussion. Satan has overthrown the Protestant Reformation. The vicar of Satan in Rome has written a new prophecy called Futurism, where the 70th week of Daniel, which was fulfilled by Jesus Messiah 2,000 years ago, is going to be fulfilled by a phony antichrist in the future. And when he fulfills it, then the Christ will, will uh, you know, ride into Jerusalem. It, it's amazing that anyone in the Protestants, in the Protestant realm, believed any of this futurist garbage. But Satan is influential. Satan is the most subtle beast of the field. And for whatever reason, Protestant has Protestantism has lost its will to live. In believing such lies, it's given up on life. It gave up on Christ. And uh, I'm going to turn it around. If nothing else, I'm going to turn it around in my life. And uh, and I'm not I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to keep this secret. You know that's 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 what the, the the Protestant evangelical pastors in this world do. They keep the truth the secret, and they preach the lies ad nauseum until everybody has memorized it by heart. And it doesn't matter that it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter that it's contrary to reason. It doesn't matter that it's contrary to prophecy. It doesn't matter that it's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach it from every pulpit in this country, and it's received by the people as though it were the truth. And I speak to you from experience. But I'm not going to remain in ignorance. I want to know the truth, and I want to spread the truth. And uh, now, at least in a different way, I have peace. I'm not delighted at all in the fact that I was deceived for 50 years of my life. And I'm righteously angry at the pastors and the priesters who have propounded this futurist malarkey all my Christian life. And I'm thankful to God for the almost impossible reality that has unfolded before me, that he has awakened me to the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden and has empowered me and encouraged me and given me the strength to teach others about it. Christ wants to liberate us from this lying wonder called teacherism. 
And uh, I'm thankful for people who uh, have written documents like the one you presented in this study to help us unlearn the lies of futurism. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think that suffices for a introduction to today's reading. And that's why we are going right into the paper now. Um, we are on page 40 of 51. And when you think that with these elf, uh, elf, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's Flemish, 11, <laughs> with these 11 remaining pages, um, our broadcasts will be done. You are far from the truth because we have so many more things to do. But we want to start with the statement that is written here. Daniel's 70th week was from 27 AD to 34 AD. The total 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel was running between 457 BC, means before Christ, to 34 AD. That is 490 years. Now, we go into 10 different points to prove that fact that I just read to you. We show you how that fact is proved. Logic requires that 70 weeks refer to one consecutive block of time. In other words, to 70 straight sequential weeks. There is no example in scripture of a state time period starting stopping and then starting again, away from Daniel chapter 9 to be understood. There is not one example in scripture of a quote-unquote countdown, I call it, that is interrupted by a certain or even uncertain period because with this futurist agenda, nobody knows how much time really is between the 69th week that ended in their understanding, and the 70 week that is to being to begin somewhere. Nobody knows the time when that will end, how big the gap is for which there is no scriptural reference. That is only Daniel chapter 9, but there is also in the whole scripture, neither in the law and the prophets, which most of you call the Old Testament, nor in the New Testament or New Covenant of Jesus Christ is one example of a stated time period that starts, stops, and then starts again. All biblical references to time are consecutive. 40 days and 40 nights, as we read in Genesis chapter 7, verse 4. 400 years in Egypt, as we read in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. 70 years of kept, up kept of captivity in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, etc., etc. All biblical references to time are consecutive. Is there something that you want to add to this first point, Tom? Certainly. I, I would like to add that if God said from this point to that point is going to be 490 years, how many how much respect do you think he would get from his from his children if it actually was 2,000 for 490 years? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Jesus said in the prophecy to Daniel, rather the angel Gabriel, but we know this is Christ who gives this information ultimately. From the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince will be 490 years. That's what the prophecy literally means. From the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, will be 490 literal years. Okay? And he takes that 490 years and breaks it into three separate consecutive periods of time. First, seven years are 49 literal years. Then 16, or I said seven years, I apologize. Seven weeks, that's, that's, that's 49 
literal years, then 62 weeks, which is three, uh, 434 literal years, added all together is 483 years. To fulfill the 490-year prophecy, there must be one week of years, seven years. And it all happened consecutively. There was no gap between the, 70, the seventh week and the eighth week. There was not a gap of even a nanosecond. Okay? At the end of that week, at the beginning of the 62 weeks to the beginning of the 70th week, there was not a nanosecond of time passed. The 69th week became the beginning of the 70th week, and it ran another seven years of time. Now, if God says from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks or 70 weeks. <clears throat> 483 years, and that's when he was baptized in the River Jordan. Prophecy fulfilled. And that kicks off the 70th week of Daniel. And there was a seven-year period of time that the gospel was preached to the Jews and to Jerusalem. And then Stephen was stoned and the gospel went to the Gentiles. No gimmicks, no tricks. No mystical interpretations, just calendar days, calendar years, just as we would expect. Look, if, if I tell you from, from this day uh, until uh, seven days from now, I'm going to be engaged in doing this or that, and I'll be done in seven days. Well, you wouldn't expect that seven days to last 240 years. I'm not the author of confusion, and neither is God. I could give another example here, Tom. Well, certainly, go ahead. <clears throat> Imagine you're the father of a child, and you tell your child at six, uh, eight o'clock in the evening, I want you, in 60 minutes, I want you to go to bed and rest and sleep until <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs> now, that child goes into his room, and uh, watch his television, and you come in there and at 11 o'clock and see, didn't I tell you to go to bed at 9 o'clock after 60 minutes after 8 o'clock? And the child then just says, but father, uh, 59 minutes have passed, but the 60th minute is still in the future. That's why I'm still watching some television here. Yeah. What would you do to that child? Yeah. <laughs> As, as a father. Spank his backside and put him in bed. And that's just exactly what's going to happen to us for believing this lie. I wanna, We're going I to wanna get put, our backside slapped. Yeah, I want to put it in other words here from another book that we are probably going to read in the future. It's a little paragraph that says, To say that the 70th week of Daniel has not been fulfilled is to deny the most, to most epic sorry, is to deny the most epic time in the history of the world. Inserting a time gap between the 69th and the 70th week makes the whole prophecy nonsensical. It makes havoc of the entire prophecy. Yet the enemy, speaking of Satan of course, has perverted the understanding of this passage to make it about the Antichrist instead of Messiah. What heresy! End quote. It's so ridiculous, it's a wonder anybody ever believed it. The listeners need to realize that futurism is so ridiculous that it's a wonder that anybody ever believed it. But we did. And I can speak for all of us, because I know all of us believed it. There's nothing else taught in the churches. 
If you have, if you didn't buy the futurist lie that is taught in all the churches, you stayed out of the churches and read the scriptures for yourself and let the Holy Spirit teach you, because that's the only way you're ever going to arrive at the truth about Daniel's seventy-week prophecy. Because the churches all lie about it. In one form or another, they teach this futurist lie. And do you know the proof, the proof positive way to identify all of the churches that preach futurism? They can't tell you who the Antichrist is. They don't know who the Antichrist is. They'll tell you he, he hasn't come yet. He hasn't arrived yet. He's in the future, and besides that, we're all going to be raptured out. We're never going to see the Antichrist. That's how you positively identify a corrupt church, an apostatized church. That's the proof positive way to identify a church that is wholly deceived. That is the proof positive way to identify a church that you don't want to be within a country mile of. If anybody cannot tell you who the Antichrist is, he's a futurist. Because anybody who is an historicist can tell you immediately who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. It was the papacy. It is the papacy. It'll always be the papacy. For as long as the papacy has existed in this world, the, pa the Antichrist has ruled and reigned. Because the Antichrist is the papacy. It's a product of the great falling away that Paul prophesied. It is that one that the, uh, that the Thessalonians knew was coming because Paul told them just as soon as the Caesars are taken out of the way, then the man of sin will be revealed. And they were waiting for him to step into history. They prayed for the longevity of the Caesars because they knew once the Caesars were taken out of the way, as cruel and persecutorial as they were against God's people. You can they read that historical the, document of the prayer in the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gretton Guinness. It's recorded by Tertullian, one of the early quote-unquote church fathers who recorded that prayer that the early Christians prayed because they understood perfectly 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, yeah. where Paul preached that. Sorry to interrupt you here, Tom, but I had, right. I had to bring that in. Yeah. Uh, people can look that prayer up on, in the book of uh, Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gretton Guinness, a book any Christian uh, any, any, anyway should know. So, Yes. They prayed for the longevity of the Caesars, not because they love Caesar, who, who, who endlessly persecuted the saints, but they knew that when the Caesars were taken out of the way, when the government of Rome changed, it would be replaced by a new governor, the Antichrist. Okay, that's when the real persecution was going to begin. And history records the fulfillment. No, And no one challenges the historical fact that that power that replaced the Caesars is none other than the papacy. No one argues that point. So Bible-believing Christians, I'm talking about Bible-believing Christians, have known for 17, 18, however long it's been, 1,800 years who the Antichrist is. And they prayed against him, they preached against him, they warned against him, and they died doing so. They were killed mercilessly. They were pursued more voraciously than even the Caesars did. 
and full well they they prayed against this man of sin in Rome. It's only our generation that doesn't know who the Antichrist is. And we can thank our pastors and our priesters for that. There's not a one of them worth their salaries. There's not a one of them that are worthy of any respect or any consideration. They need to be kicked out of the churches, and if allowed to stay in the churches, they only be allowed to sit in the back of the church with their mouth taped shut. Back to you, Yerk. I have kind of a question, Tom. And that is because I am, as you know, not churched. I never was in any congregation in Protestant churches. I never joined the Roman Catholic Church. I never joined any sect, whether it's um, the Mormons or Latter-day Saints or Seventh-day Adventists or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Catholic Church whatsoever. I never was in a church. All the study that I did, all this, uh, all these things that came just to me via the internet, I studied that and I never was in a church. So I don't know what they teach in the church, but my impression is, and you can confirm that or say it is not so, in the churches when they teach futurism, they teach a seven-year tribulation, they teach a pre-trip, mid-trip or post-trip rapture out of that, and they preach a future Antichrist, but I'm not sure that they even make the reference to that that all is deriving out of their false interpretation of Daniel chapter 9. As far as I understand it, when I look at many videos on YouTube and many comments on, on YouTube in this regard, I have the impression that they don't even refer to Daniel chapter 9, maybe if explicitly asked, but otherwise they just suck that out of their thumb, like this uh, Jennings and, and, and these other um, authors of this Left Behind series books do. You're talking about Jenkins. Uh, yeah. Jenkins, yeah. Sorry, Jenkins. Yeah. Yeah. Jennings, Jennings is the one who wrote this book uh, of Futurism uh, versus Preterism. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Jenkins. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I have the feeling, Tom, we always refer to Daniel chapter 9 and the correct interpretation, the biblical interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. But to many people, that is something they probably hear for the very first time because they only know the futurist teaching, but they do not know where it derives from because the link that's, is, that's not, how is they not laid. Deceive people. That's how they deceive people because if, if you are careful enough like a Berean to search the scriptures to see if these things are so, you're going to go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and you're going to read it the way I read it. You see that the way that I read it in this little uh, paragraph that I just read, yeah. it makes havoc of the entire prophecy. It is absolutely nonsensical, the whole prophecy. That's right. When you understand what Daniel wrote, what uh, the uh, angel Gabriel told Daniel in the prophecy, and you read it for yourself, even in a corrupted Bible, right. you see no gap. There's no gap. Not even implied. And that's my point. The yeah. whole futurist teaching is actually ripped off of the basis that it is based on, which is Daniel yeah. chapter 9. But they don't teach that. They only teach tribulation, tribulation, tribulation. But yeah. don't worry because you'll be raptured out. Everything is fine. Love one another. Kumbaya. Yeah. yeah it's just a masterful piece of deception. And, uh, well, masterful in, this, in, 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 the, in the sense that it deceived the whole world. But if you look at the deception, it's childish. And it's a wonder anybody ever believed it. If you have Daniel's prophecy in front of you and read the New Testament, you can't possibly believe in futurism. 
It's like giving you a dice and telling you you hold a marble in your hand. And and the beauty of it, the beauty of this deception is that it's all speculative. It's all supposed to be, you see, see, this is the thing. If they want to cast the 70th week of Daniel into the future, into the distant future, just before Christ returns, you can say anything you want to about it. It's all speculation. There's no need to prove anything. It's impossible to prove anything because it isn't fulfilled yet. That's why, look, what what the, 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 the futurists are... are collectively getting frustrated with you know because the fulfillment of their 70th week of daniel just isn't coming off like they predicted it's been ever since 1948 when the modern nation state of israel was established in the world until today 2021 and still there's no temple on temple mount jerusalem there's no hope of animal sacrifices again And you can't have an Antichrist come and sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease if there's no temple, there's no priesthood, there's no sacrifice for him to stop. So even the futurists are beginning to wonder, did we believe a lie? They won't talk about it openly, but you can hear speculation Maybe we've missed something somewhere. Yeah, you sure did. You missed the truth. You missed the truth that happened 2,000 years ago. The 70th week of Daniel began immediately after the end of the 69th. And what happened on that day? Jesus was baptized. He was anointed by the Holy Father. He was given commission to preach the gospel of the good news. This is my beloved son. And the the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. That's the beginning of the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblation to cease. When he confirmed that covenant with his own blood, he signed his covenant with his own blood. He secured your salvation, my salvation, and anybody else who put themselves under his blood. Okay? (coughs) Reconciliation for iniquity, that's what he achieved. Everlasting righteousness, that's what he achieved. He fulfilled that prophecy every jot and every tittle. And our whole faith, our whole hope, depends on that 70th week of Daniel. And after that, there was only three and a half more years for the spirit-filled apostles to continue to preach the covenant to the Jews and to Jerusalem until the Sanhedrin, after three and a half years, finally rejected that gospel, finally rejected the covenant. And they stoned Stephen to shut him up. And the gospel, the 490th year, the end of the 70th week of Daniel came, and the gospel went to the Gentiles, where it's been preached by the Gentiles ever since. You know, you said it best. You want proof that the 70th week of Daniel is over? Just ask the question, who's responsible for the spreading of the gospel today? Is it a Jew? Or Gentile. It's the Gentiles. We've had it for 2,000 years. It's been our responsibility to evangelize the world with the gospel of the new covenant in Christ's blood. And to provoke the Jews to jealousy, Tom. And to provoke them, while we're in the process, provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah. That's the whole commission of the Christian world to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah, their own Jewish Messiah. And instead, what we do? Persecuted the Jews. We still do. People call themselves Christians and persecute the Jews. They identify themselves as Christ killers when they persecute the Jews. Because Christ died for those Jews, just like he died for us.
it's it's an absolute abomination for any professed Christian to persecute a Jew. It's a failure of our commission. It's a failure of our commission to persecute a Jew, to call them Christ killers. They've only been temporarily blinded for our sake so that we could be added to the kingdom, us Gentiles, us dogs, us Goya. We, too, are beneficiaries of that covenant. God has grafted us in. Now, what should we have but compassion for the Jews? Loving compassion, long-suffering and patience for the Jews so that they would be adopted back into the family. And what is this modern nation state of Israel? Is it really a gift for the Jews, the persecuted Jews? No. It's given to them for their own destruction so that they will eat and drink damnation to themselves in a rebuilt temple with animal sacrifices that can never take away sin. Because when you make a sacrifice after once receiving the sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all, for all men, for all time, what is it when you make another sacrifice? You reject the one that Jesus made. That's what the world wants for the Jews. The answer to the final Jewish question is to cause the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves by making another sacrifice except the only one that can take away sin. Now you know what purpose is behind the whole Christian the whole Christian world. But it's not Christian. It's anti-Christian. It's Roman Catholic. And I don't care if they call themselves Baptist. I don't care if they call themselves Presbyterian. I don't care if they call themselves Methodist. I don't care if they call themselves Seventh-day Adventist. If they're, if they're anxious for a building of a temple and a resumption of animal sacrifices in Jerusalem, Israel, they are working for the man of sin in Rome. They just as well quit this charade and call themselves what they are, Roman Catholics. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I just have to see to get the picture straight, you know, then we can go continue in the reading. To get back where we were, there's no gap between the seventh week and the eighth week. There's no gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. It was consecutive, just like it read right off the calendar. There's no gap. There's only the church age after the fulfilling of the 70th week and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. 70th week of Daniel is over. Anything attached to a future 70th week is straight from the pit. And its purpose is to deceive you into receiving a false Christ. That's what it's all about. Satan's going to have his day. And how is his day coming about? By Christians. Satan has actually harnessed the power of the entire Christian world to bring to pass his prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14. That's the purpose of the Christian world today. So in point one, it says, logic requires that 70 weeks refer to one consecutive block of time. And in point two, it says, logic also requires that the 70th week follow, follows immediately after the 69th week. If it doesn't, then it cannot properly be called the 70th week. That's right. Point three. It is illogical to insert a 2000 plus minus. Huh? We have to be honest because we don't know how big the gap really is. Gap yeah. between the 69th and the 70th week. 
no hint of a gap is found in the prophecy itself. There is no gap, as Tom just said before, and he didn't know the text, between the first seven weeks and the following 62, means after the finishing of the seventh and the beginning of the eighth week. So why insert one between the 69th and the 70th week? Point 4. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says nothing about a seven-year period of tribulation. It says nothing about a rebuilt Jewish temple. And it says nothing, not a thing of any Antichrist. The stated focus of this prophecy is the Messiah, from beginning to end, not the Antichrist. After the Messiah is cut off, referring to Christ's death, the text says, quote, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Unquote. In the past, this has been consistently applied to the destruction of Jerusalem and the Second Temple by Roman armies led by Prince Titus in AD 70. But is that the only view? No, because we said earlier that the prophecy of Daniel 9 is in no place about the Antichrist, only concerning Christ, the Jews and Jerusalem. So the Prince in verse 26 is Christ, and the people are the Jews who, by their disobedience, are responsible for the destruction of the temple. And there is point, 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 page 41, because this is a quote that I took from another book on page 41. It says here, um, Daniel 9.26 says that Messiah will be cut off, killed after the 62-week period, which we know is after the seven weeks. It's saying <clears throat> that Messiah will appear after 69 weeks are fulfilled, proving that he appeared in the 70th week. He was killed not because he sinned, but for the sins of his people. Daniel 9.27 that Messiah will confirm the everlasting covenant in the last week, and that his death causes the temple sacrifices to cease if uh, to be needed. It's saying that Messiah died in the middle of the remaining week, the middle of the 70th week. When we look at the two narratives, all we see is the people, the Jews and Messiah the Prince. Those are the people of the 70 week prophecy. That's very important to be understood. We know also by changing from the 1769 Blaney KJV to the AV 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible that there in Daniel chapter 9 verses 25 and 26, I think it is, where the prince is named, the prince is twice written with a capital letter. In the 1769 Blaney version it's not. And therefore it is important for us to understand that the whole chapter of Daniel only speaks of the Jews, as it says in Daniel 9, chapter 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and thy holy city, Jerusalem, and it speaks of Messiah. Those are the only quote-unquote actors, if I may say or use the term for once, that play a role in Daniel chapter 9. So the prince in verse 26 is Jesus Christ and the people who are the Jews who by their disobedience took care that the temple would be destroyed. That is very clear, I hope, for you all to understand that. It was physically the Romans. We don't go into discussion about that. That is absolutely historically proven. But it is the spiritual responsibility. And Daniel chapter 9 is, like many other prophecies, 
a prophecy has to be understood spiritually. The people of the prince that shall come, the prince is Jesus Christ, the people of the prince are the Jews who, by their disobedience, worked for the destruction of the temple. And Jesus told them that in the Olivet Discourse, which you can read in Matthew chapter 4. That is also for a later study that we will go into that. Any comments on that, Tom? I just want to reiterate the point that uh, that must be understood. In nowhere in Daniel's prophecy is the Antichrist referred to either directly or indire indirectly. This prophecy isn't about the Antichrist. It's all about the prince, Messiah the prince. The prince that shall come, which is by the futurist has been said, is the Antichrist, is not the Antichrist at all. It's Jesus Christ, the people of the prince that shall come. That is, the people of Jesus shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, Look, did not Jesus cause the Babylonians to destroy that temple just 500 years earlier? That's correct. It was Jesus who sent the Babylonians to punish Israel and to take them away captive for 70 years because they had been 70 years in arrears for allowing the land to lie fallow, for not allowing the promised land to enjoy all of her Sabbaths. That's what Daniel determined by reading the books, that they were being punished and their punishment would last 70 years. The land would lie fallow, Israel would lie fallow because there was not a man left in it to farm it. Well, Daniel understood why they were being punished. And God used the Babylonians. At that point, the Babylonians were God's people to render judgment upon Israel. And likewise, Messiah the Prince caused the people to, to destroy the city and the sanctuary, the Romans to destroy the city and the sanctuary. There's not one word in that prophecy about, about the, the Antichrist, not directly nor indirectly. It's all about Jesus Christ. And if you can comprehend that, you're well on your way to understanding the unfolding of this gigantic deception that's attached to the alternative interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, the futurist interpretation. It's the, the interpretation that is heard in all the churches. You can't hardly get away from it unless you get out of the churches. And that's what I recommend everybody do. Our churches have turned against us. They've turned against Christ. They've turned against us. They're teaching us lies, critical lies. Because if you believe in futurism, you have been deceived. And let me tell you from my own personal experience, without God's help, it's nigh unto impossible to get that futurist garbage out of your mind. And you've got to forget the lies that they've been teaching you in the churches ever since about 1810. You've got to return to the orthodox interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, which is historical. Apostolic. In its interpretation. It's apostolic in its understanding, all the way back to Paul. Paul predicted the, 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 the fulfillment of Daniel's, uh, of, of the, the coming of the Antichrist. He said Christ cannot come on, because there have been rumors spreading about that Christ had already returned that the day of the Lord had already taken place, all right, and that the people were not resurrected, that they were lost. 
and Paul had to correct them. Oh, you've been deceived. The man, Christ has not come, and he cannot come until first there's a falling away, a great apostasy. And then that man of sin will be revealed. Well, it took that great apostasy to bring forth the man of sin in Rome. Okay? And that great apostasy was the Romanization of the gospel. Okay? That's when the Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity and just lumped it in together with every other pagan religion. When he Christianized started, the pagan religion of Rome. Yeah. That's right. When he Christianized the pagan religions of Rome and when he paganized the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the great falling away. Who can argue with that? Somebody will try if they're still stuck in their futurist delusion, they'll try, but they will fail because it doesn't, it defies common sense. It defies historical sense. It defies pro, prophetic sense. It makes no sense. The great falling away was taking place even as Paul was preaching. He said, I'm afraid after my demise, there'll be what? We're ravenous wolves come in amongst you. And, and they he also, did. They were, he also they, said the mystery of iniquity does already work. That's right. That's the, the strongest apostasy. proof that Paul was aware of the Simon Magus instrumental antichrist power already was in working. That and Hymenaeus and Philetus and the other people that were, were getting together with the Gnostics. He saw the great falling away taking place in, in his very day. It wasn't that he was prophesying something that was, un, that was not even apparent at the time. He was simply identifying a great falling away that was taking place even at his day. And it culminated into the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. The rise of the Roman Catholic Church and the rise of the papacy is the culmination of what Daniel saw or what uh, Paul saw taking place even in his day. And uh, the historicists comprehend all these things. It's, there's no controversy amongst them. And they're, they're comfortable. They've always been comfortable with their prophetic interpretation because there's nothing to contradict it. History and prophecy are like a hand in glove. There's a perfect fit. History Between and prophecy, prophecy shake hands in historicism, Tom. Yes, they, they, historicism is when prophecy and history shake hands. And they embrace one another. There's no controversy. It's when you start trying to twist the scripture and to twist history into some futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. That's when all the trouble comes. And all these troublemakers, all these futurist troublemakers have one ace in the hole. Everything is future. No one's got any concrete reasons to argue with it. So they all take their own turn embellishing their futurist delusion. It's just like... I won't even use the the term that I would normally use to describe it in, in mixed company. It's filthy is what it is. It's perverted. That That's what futurism is. It's, it's perverted. And uh, it's contrary to common sense or any other kind of sense. And... Uh, the I, lack I'll, of I'll, sense, Tom. That's what most people have in this regard. The lack of sense. It's a delusion. Yeah. It's the greatest delusion ever since the Garden of Eden. It's it, it it should be it should be routed out of our churches. It should be routed out. Not one vestige of it remaining. And if that's not possible, then you have to come out of your church, as God that's calls right. you to in Revelation chapter eighteen, verse four. Come yeah. out of her, my people. That's exactly the same as in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Yeah. Come out of her, my people. 
It's concerning the same people. It's concerning the true Israelites. You just notice for yourself when you're on YouTube watching watching videos about the 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 the, the, uh, the coming economic crisis, the crunch, the global economic crisis, the global pandemics, the global uh, shortage in in uh, in uh, natural resources, as though God were ignorant and inept and couldn't provide enough for his a world full of people. All of this, all of this doomsday, all of this uh, apocalyptic teaching, and you read down through the comments after those after those videos, and you can see all of the futurists. What do they do? Praying for the rapture. Come, Lord Jesus. They always say, "Come, Lord Jesus," and that's all it is. They they're they're scared to death of all the hype that's been put upon this world, all the apocalyptic horrors that are paraded in full view of the people every day, all day long. And the response is from the futurists all over this world. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. They're ready for the rapture any day now, Lord Jesus. How in the world are they going to cope with reality when the rapture never comes? And what faith are they going to have left in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when we're forced to go through all these tribulations. They will be so disillusioned, Tom, as uh, Albert Pike supposedly wrote in his letter to Mazzini in 1870 or 1871, yep. that people will become so disillusioned with quote-unquote Christianity, because we are actually speaking, of course, of the Roman Catholic teaching, yep. That's that right. they will turn to Luciferianism. That's right. They will yep. turn to the quote-unquote light that shines then in the world. And that is the yep. light the papacy presents to you. Yep. Mazzini and, and uh, Albert Pike were wise enough to realize that whenever a Roman Catholic finally realizes just what a filthy religion Roman Catholicism is, Roman Catholics every day come to this conclusion around the world. That it is an absolute abhorrent religion. And they come out of the Roman Catholic Church. What do they do? They either become atheist or they become Luciferian. And so, whenever the Roman Catholic Church, in all their false prophecies, all their futurist baloney, when it doesn't come to fruition, There'll be so much delusion, uh, so much uh, dissatisfaction with the whole Christian world. The Christians all over the world will be giving up their faith and becoming agnostic or, or, or atheist or Luciferian. Atheists. And then they'll be fit for Freemasonry, which worships Lucifer. And... and you know, Mazzini and and uh, Albert Pike. Pike made all this made all this evident in their writing. That was their strategy. And so Freemasonry is just the Protestant wing of the Je of the Jesuit order. That's yeah, all it is. Not to forget, Tom, that Albert Pike was a thirty third degree high Freemason, and Mazzini uh, on the Italian side also. He was the founder of the Mafia. They were both high-level Freemasons. So sure. whenever they put this quote-unquote letter out there, of which mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if it's legitimate, it is there to tell the people what's going to happen anyway because they don't use their sense in reading and studying the Bible. And that's no, the can't. whole purpose of our broadcast that we do, that people pick up the Bible, that they let go of all this worldly attractions like the letter of Mazzini and the COVID corona hype in this world yeah. and this doomsday global reset uh, teaching that is everywhere that is only there to infuse fear into you. Yeah. When you have Jesus Christ who sets you free, you don't have fear anymore. Yeah. You have overcome the world. When you have Christ in you, Christ has overcome the world. That's what he stated. I have overcome the world, he said. If you have Christ in you, you have also overcome the world. You are prepared to live your spiritual life 
even when still in the flesh, you leave your you you live your spiritual life. You will not be tested by the demons and the devils of this world anymore. They cannot touch you because you hold up the whole armor of God as in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 stated. You are prepared for the truth because you have the truth in your hand. And when you don't have fear, you can't be handled by the Antichrist. You will not obey the Antichrist because you know that the papacy is, was and always will be the Antichrist. Because you have made free, you have been made free with the freedom that only Christ can give you. Nobody else. Yeah. Now, suffice it to say that God's people throughout history have always known who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. Whatever man was sitting on the throne in Rome, he was the Antichrist of his day. The Antichrist is an office, okay? A, a perpetual office. And uh, he's the one, the papacy is the one that fulfills all the prophecies concerning the Antichrist. And there's not a possibility that it could be anyone else but the papacy. That's, that's the glorious part about this. There's, God leaves us no room to be uh, deceived. God there's, leaves there's, no room for error, Tom. That's right. There's no possible way to get it wrong. Okay. But when no you rather way. listen to man instead of God, when you rather listen to the teaching of the world instead of reading your Bible, then no. you have room for error in your eschatology, in your Bible exegesis. Mm -hmm. Oh. And that's the wonderful part about this, uh, these writings that we're studying. They bring out every scripture in the New Testament. Not, well, not everyone. I don't think this is a, this is a, a, a complete dissertation. Uh, that's why I said in a previous broadcast, uh, I, want, I want the listeners to do their own research in the New Testament and pull out the rest of the scriptures that confirm that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago in the last seven years of Daniel's prophecy. And uh, you're going to you're going to be stunned with the evidence that has been right before your very eyes ever since you first opened the Bible. Confirming the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled by none other than Jesus Christ. And when you read Daniel's prophecy, you have to come to the conclusion. Well, why was this ever in question? Because the Antichrist confused the whole world with futurism. And it's been preached from your pulpit and my pulpit and every other pro every other Protestant, Evangelical, and Roman Catholic Church around the world. Everybody's talking about a seven-year period of time. Everybody's talking about a seven-year period of great tribulation. Everybody's ignorant about who the Antichrist is. All these things are proof positive that they're futurist churches, that they're futurist people, that they've been deceived with futurism. Because a historicist can tell you always who the Antichrist is. Okay? We can tell you precisely when the 70th week of Daniel began and when it ended. And what was accomplished in the middle of that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. We, don't, are, we can't be questioned by anyone. Why? Because the evidence of what we believe is codified in the Bible, in the New Testament. It's chronicled there. It's an unalterable record of history proving our assertion. There's no greater authority in the world than the New Testament confirming 
that the 70th week of Daniel is over, 2,000 years ago over, and it was fulfilled by Messiah, the prince, the prince that shall come, the prince that Daniel prophesied. And how the Christian world ever departed from its historical understanding of Daniel's prophecy is a mystery that only God can reveal. And uh, I'm, I'm just sick and tired of, of listening to all the futurist responses to uh, every Christian video that you see on YouTube. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can, whatever time I've got left in this world, to, to correct the record, to straighten out all this futurist nonsense. And what a refreshing, what a refreshing thing it is uh, to hear the truth finally. Something that we can wrap our brains around. Something that makes sense. Not only common sense, but scriptural sense and prophetic sense. All of a sudden, history and scripture shake hands. It's wonderful to come to the knowledge of the truth, but it opens up a horror that is hard to articulate. It's hard to express in understandable terms the horror that is brought to reality, the futurist horror, and the position that has put every, every Christian in this world. I'll just... I'll just end with this. I know we're out of time. But to fulfill this phony, futurist delusion, it cost the world World War I, World War II, and the current World War, and countless lives, countless debt, Countless lives. Stop to think about it. To create this modern nation state of Israel and to force the Jews down there to live cost us World War I and World War II and the current World War. Somebody put a price on that. Now are you beginning to see how important this discussion is? If you understand the truth about historicism and you understand what a diabolical lie futurism is, all of a sudden now you understand the consequences of believing that futurist lie. The consequences were in part, not in total, there's a whole lot yet more to be re re revealed about this futurism. But at least we know it cost us World War I and World War II and the current World War. The earth is soaked with the blood of soldiers all over the world that made the modern nation state of Israel possible. And you can't put a price on that. And if we continue in this futurist delusion, what could it cost in the future? What could the cost finally be in the future? I'll leave it back to Yerk. Well, the answer to that question, Tom, is the loss of our salvation. I tell you, I don't believe Christ is an Indian giver. When he saves a man, he saves him thoroughly. He saves him forever. But there's a cost to being ignorant in this world. Yeah, well, I speak we'll of the people who are betrayed by this delusion, oh, Tom. Yes. The, the, uh, yes. the eventual cost of that would be the loss of their salvation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying the people who are saved lose being saved because whether you are saved or you're not saved, whether your name is written in the book of life or your name is not written in the book of life. 
but all the ones that are betrayed by this futurist delusion are the ones who will lose their inheritance. Their suffice it to say, life. suffice it to say, there is an incalculable cost at believing the futurist lie. I'll just leave it go at that. <laughs> Say 